I'd now like to welcome to the stage Lee Jarvis and Abin Xavier for our first practitioner talk. Thanks very much for that warm welcome and thanks for the introduction, Dean. So my name's Lee and this is my colleague, Abin, and we're here to tell you a story about how Booking.com have uh, implemented FinOps uh, over the last few years. And first, I want to welcome ourselves, I suppose, to the FinOps Foundation. We've recently joined as a premier member, um, taking the place of Priceline. So Booking.com and Booking Holdings is a group of companies. Uh, our mission is to make it easier for everybody to experience the world. And a quick question, uh, who's a customer of Booking.com? <laughs> lot of hands, wow, that's lovely to see. This makes the next slide a lot easier. So, so Booking.com operate at scale, and that means billions of ads book room nights, tens of billions of dollars of revenue, and that brings a set of challenges. We've achieved this scale through uh, on-premise, uh, complex on-premise infrastructure, very bespoke, very custom, infrastructure, and we've built that across the past 20 years. It's enabled us to scale. It's uh, a huge achievement for us. But our step into the future is public cloud. And what we started to see was that growth of spend in public cloud kind of get away from us. And we're like, oh, hang on a minute. Now that the individual teams can drive cost, we want to start to focus on how we control that and how we apply great practice. And those historical challenges really matter because teams weren't used to understanding or really caring about cost. Um, and they were mostly just focused on how do I, do I deliver my feature. It also meant that the practice of FinOps, that knowledge just wasn't in the business. And so we took the decision in 2022 to bring in an external consultancy and help us just kind of kickstart. And very early it was clear to us that we wanted to uh, do things our own way. And so the story we're going to tell you today is how we've moved through the maturity phases of crawl, walk, and run, and how we've moved through the uh, FinOps phases of inform, operate, and optimize. And we'll also indicate the topic, whether it's AI or uh, FinOps is everybody's responsibility. <coughs> and so what we decided to do at Booking was tackle the operate phase first. Big, multi-business unit organization. We wanted to make sure that we were partnering with our colleagues in finance to just set that foundation, have everybody understand how we wanted to operate. And with the help of that uh, consultancy that I referenced earlier, we decided to define an operating model that was really right for us at Booking.com. And because that innovation and that cost is driven by Leaf teams, the engineers on the ground doing the thing, we decided to bring that accountability to those uh, workload owners, those project cost owners, in our experience. And to make sure that the right thing was being done, we took a decision to make sure that those project cost owners had support from their leadership, the right accountability, and also from our central FinOps team and from our FinOps, uh, finance department. And so that was how we started. That was the model. And if I'm to reflect on this, the, the first thing that I'd say to you all is just start. Just do something, um, because we learned that starting late meant that we had a bigger hill to climb. And you know, don't look at the FinOps framework that JR showed you earlier and be like, oh man, like, where do I start? Like, what do I do? Treat it like building blocks. Just do the first thing that feels right that you think is going to get you started. And do what's right for your organization. That operating model that I showed you works for us. It might not work for you. So treat it as inspiration. Yeah, morning everyone. Uh, great to be here as part of a community of like-minded people uh, practicing FinOps. Uh, over the next few slides, I'm going to take you through some of the software solutions that we have built to enable our FinOps framework. So when we started off this journey, the primary challenge for us was how do we deal with a multi-cloud environment? So Booking uses more than one public cloud for its solutions, and the team might have a solution deployed on multiple cloud providers. So how do we enable them to see their costs aggregated in a, in a timely fashion? So we decided to use an external financial management tool to achieve this. So we pull the data from multiple sources. We attributed costs at different levels, teams, cost owners, uh, the framework that Lee showed earlier. And this was really the first step for us. So you could see your costs and understand how much you're spending. Uh, but that was not enough, right? So JR mentioned earlier, FinOps is a cultural practice. So it is important to see how your engineers are reacting to this. It is important to embed the software into 
their existing ecosystem. So Booking uses a whole bunch of applications to deliver software to, uh, to their uh, website. So you, we have Tableau where business metrics are being collected. Our engineers use Grafana for dashboards. Uh, we use Backstage, which is an open source uh, Spotify framework to list our services. So the next challenge for us was how do we enable our customers to see the cost usage in all of these different ecosystems. So what we did is we created a FinOps layer, an integration layer, that pulled the data from this external uh, financial management tool and pushed it out to all of these sources so an engineer could actually go to an existing dashboard that they had, pull in the metrics from cost and forecast, and kind of actively monitor how much they are spending against their forecast. So that was the first step that we did. That was not enough. Another important step that we think is to understand your anomalies. So are you spending the way that you're expected to spend? So the next step for us was to build a notification system, uh, which kind of uses the same APIs as I mentioned before, understands what the patterns for your spend are. So if you're a cost owner, and if you are currently projecting to spend more than what you're forecasted, we warn you well in advance that this is going to happen so that you can take appropriate steps and address your cost uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, another solution, of course, is, uh, is we are on the AI train as well. So we have had our first success in terms of an AI solution we launched about a couple of months back. So the use case was this. Uh, in a company like Booking.com, uh, with continuously evolving teams and structures, uh, the people who are supposed to follow the FinOps practices may not be always aware of what is to be done. Where do I submit my forecast? Who has to, who has to approve the forecast once I submit it? So what we were seeing was, on our Slack channels, there was a continuous barrage of questions coming, and they were repeated again and again. So uh, we understood that this is a good use case, a customer service use case that we could use. So what we did is we fed all of this FinOps process documentation into this AI agent. We hooked on this AI agent to our Slack channel, and this AI agent has now become our first line of uh, answering your customer questions. So if someone comes on to the Slack channel and asks a question that's uh, well understood, the AI agent gives a very effective answer. We have seen process efficiencies of over 60% after we launched this, so that's a big win for us in terms of solution. Uh, another strategic decision that we took to bring our forecasting real estate under control is that we have shifted left. And what I mean by this is, if you are an engineer in Booking.com today and you want to deploy a new solution out to cloud, you will not be allowed to do this. Our deployment tools block you before you have submitted a forecast. And this effectively has made us stop the caching up game. So if we, if, before we did this, what we were doing was once you launch a new software, we go out to the teams, we ensure that they have a forecast in place. By simply by shifting left and making this a necessary step to go to cloud, we have ensured that most of our real estate has got an active forecast at the moment. So that's a big thing for us as well. Uh, so how, w what's the main takeaway uh, for us from this section? Uh, meet your customers where you are. Don't, don't try to build uh, new things out there which are completely different from your existing ecosystem. Engineers are a fun, funny bunch. They are creatures of habit. They want to use tools that they're used to using. So try, try, to, try to fetch the data from appropriate sources. Try to push it to the existing ecosystem. Meet your customers where you are. And so Abin spoke to you a little bit about how we're bringing the data to our customers, how we're helping them uh, control their spend. And that really helps them then focus on how we optimize against that spend. And at Booking.com, we decided to put together our own framework. Uh, it's fundamentally based on the FinOps practice and the FinOps framework. And where we started because of our scale is we're able to leverage private pricing. That might not be right for you, um, but it was our first kind of bastion of, uh, of how we save money. And then moving on to things like reserved instances, uh, those core savings mechanisms as the foundation for our customers. The hard bit is then for those workload owners to drive optimization through things like right sizing. And we're doing things like bringing in recommendations to our customers, embedding architectural uh, decision making up front to make sure that they're following things like the well architected framework. Uh, and of course, all of the tools that Abin showed you here's your cost, make sure you're not going over it, that kind of optimization through control, no accidental spend. And that's really core. And underneath all that, you know, the hot topic and a real focus for today, AI, we're bringing 
uh, more accuracy to our forecasting, more support to our customers to make those choices easier, lower that barrier to entry. And that's why this, this framework is really important to us at Booking.com. And it's helped us deliver some impressive numbers for us. Earlier on in our journey in this crawl phase, we were looking at something like 5% savings on top of our uh, initial contractual savings. This year, we'll be hitting something like 18 to 20% savings on if we did nothing. Um, and as we move into that walking fast or, or that run phase, we're hoping to achieve more like a quarter uh, of our cost savings. And for us uh, and the size of our investment, that's real change. So I'm really happy to see these numbers. And, you know, dollars is one thing, but what's core to me um, and, and what is important to Booking.com as we've set out our net zero target is that we're also growing our uh, cloud investment in a responsible way. And we're committed to a net zero target, and the first step to help our customers do the right thing is to, again, bring that data to them. So right by your workload, right beside your cost, you can also see how many kilograms of carbon that your workload is driving. And so for AI, as you'll imagine, that number's way bigger. So what choices can you make to do the right thing there? And what we are seeking to do is uh, increase and focus the scope of that finance practice to say, hey, you know, your carbon is just like dollars, um, and so you have a budget. This year it's 400 kilograms, next year it's 350. What optimizations can you put in place to, to make that happen? And of course, you can't make these choices without having the right tools and the right knowledge at hand. And so we're bringing training to our customers internally, um, both through the FinOps Foundation platform and through our internal training platform. We're going to our customers, we're getting with them, walking through their problems, understanding how that works through brand bag sessions. And you stumble across folks that are really passionate about the topic and they're our champions. That's our network of people to really embed in the teams and do the right thing. And that means they do our internal marketing for us. They tell the story about how they've deployed, I don't know, S3 intelligence here and or something and how much money that's saved. And that means that getting that leadership buy-in is so much easier. The value that's being achieved is being marketed internally, both centrally and from our lead teams. And here's a few examples of, of some of that training and engagement. And so the reflection really here for me is the way you set yourself up for success is by providing your customers with the right information, the right maturity, the right training. Because, you know, as a central team, we're one set of people, but it's the company that really has to drive that change forward, and this is how it's worked for us. And some of the results uh, uh, speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, so what have we achieved by rolling out this framework, right? So the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So the first two metrics over there kind of denote our overall uh, landscape in terms of ownership. So when we started out this journey two years back, I believe it was around 60% that we had the coverage for. So 60% of our total projects had a forecast already applied, which we could track against. Uh, the last numbers that we see is around 99%. So the first two metrics are simply showing the cost ownership uh, of our entire public cloud landscape. Uh, the third one over there is what Lee touched upon earlier. It's the uh, percentage increase in the optimization savings that we have had. It is a mind-boggling 166% over the last two years in terms of numbers. Of course, we can't reveal the actual number, but you can imagine it to be a bunch of zeros. Uh, the last one over there uh, is, is the latest forecast results from our entire public cloud landscape. So uh, I think in 2024 March, when we compared our uh, predicted forecast against our actual numbers, the variance was around 30%, so it was off by around 30%. March 2025, we did the same numbers again. Our forecast accuracy is over 99%. So the total number that we have predicted as what we're gonna spend in March and the decisions being taken by those individual teams that Lee mentioned adds up to a 99% accuracy, which is a big, big uh, metric for us in terms of uh, impact. So that's big for us, but our, our journey doesn't end here. FinOps is a continuously evolving uh, journey. It's an iterative journey. You have to listen to your customers, understand what their pain points are, feed that back into your system. You have to adopt new technologies that are coming out in the market. So we have big plans for the next two years. Uh, some of those are on screen right now. Optimizations and saving engines. So this is a new thing that we are building. 
we want to understand your optimization opportunities, assign them to the individual teams. Since we have the cost ownership problem solved, we know exactly which person to reach out to when you want to optimize a certain service or an application. We're going to leverage that. We're going to send out the optimization recommendations directly to the team and track it in terms of how, how they're doing. Uh, AI, again, we are having a bunch of projects right now uh, in flight. Essentially, we are trying to solve the forecasting problem and or make it e easier for our customers to forecast. So we have all the data that we have uh, from cloud providers, from internal systems. We're going to feed that into AI agents and use that as an AI assistant to help with the forecasting process. Uh, JR mentioned earlier about scopes. Yeah, that, that's a big topic for us as well. Uh, so we have effectively rolled out this framework to our public cloud uh, domain. We think the same can be done for our internal on-prem uh, data centers and infrastructure. So we want to have one framework across board, whether it's cloud or internal on-premise data centers, and we want to roll that out as a single use case. And lastly, we want to kind of gamify this process. So I think there is value to be had if you can show how certain teams are doing and how effective they are. And we're going to have some leaderboards, some FinOps champions, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to kind of make it more effective as a framework. So what's the key takeaway? There's no one right way. The framework that you see is building blocks. Your culture is your culture and leverage those things and the skill that you've all acquired. I saw a lot of hands up about people uh, doing two, five, seven years of practice, and apply that against your business. And lastly, I'd like to say thank you to you all. We're available if you want to chat and catch up. I'd love to learn from you folks. And uh, thanks very much to FinOps Foundation for having us. Hey everyone, producer Andrew here. I hope you enjoy this video as much as I enjoy sharing all of these amazing FinOps stories, best practices, and expertise. Please take a moment to like, subscribe, click the notification bell, and leave comments and questions for our speakers. Check out more FinOps content on our YouTube channel. We appreciate the support.